Hi. So in the third uh, video lecture on uh, DEA, we will dive a little bit more deeper to the production theory. So we have so far discussed the application of DEA and the mathematical programming formulations. So now we want to learn, uh, ask ourselves uh, why those uh, mathematical programming formulations make sense. So we observed before already that uh, to apply DEA, the user must uh, make some specification about the returns to scale and perhaps more generally something about the production technology. And uh, another choice that the user needs to make is the choice of the input oriented, output oriented or some other orientation. So basically what kind of efficiency metric is used for the performance analysis. Uh, at this point, I want to highlight that, uh, that um, these are two separate issues. So this has caused, I believe, uh, some confusion in the literature, but actually it doesn't really matter what kind of efficiency metric is used to measure performance. Uh, that doesn't influence the production technology in any way and vice versa. The choice of the production technology also doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, connect to the efficiency metric. So, I mean, these are two separate issues. Let me start with an illustrative example. So this is adopted from the DEA tutorial that uh, Sheng Dai has prepared. So the purpose of this example is simply to illustrate that how the variable returns to scale and constant returns to scale technologies will look like uh, in the special case of just a single input variable and just a single output variable. So in this example, we have just uh, six uh, observations or firms uh, labeled as A, B, C, D, E, and F. And on the small table in the bottom part of the figure of the slide will illustrate the values used in this example. We think about the constant returns to scale frontier. So uh, the constant uh, returns to scale frontier would be simply this line that uh, starts from the origin and passes through the observation C. And in this example, then the observation C is the only 100% uh, efficient unit that can be scaled up or down to, to form the benchmarks for all other, other units. The VRS frontier in this example has three 100% efficient units, A, C, and E. So the VRS frontier is this uh, broken line, uh, which, which, uh, which is then uh, indicating the frontier and the three other units B, D and F are inefficient because they are contained uh, below both the VRS and CRS frontiers. So uh, we can think about the um, uh, VRS frontier as the, as the uh, approximation of the production function and uh, the area, all, all points in the interior or below this uh, frontier, they form this kind of DEA VRS production possibility set. Same is true, of course, for CRS. So all points below this straight line from the origin that passes through C, all points below that line belong to the CRS uh, production possibility set. To measure the performance, then, the choice of the orientation is a completely different matter. So by choosing CRS or VRS, we have specified the frontier, but um, to measure performance, Let's take, for example, the last unit, the F. So if we use the uh, output-oriented uh, output efficiency metric, uh, so the red line indicates that we are trying to expand the outputs of, of unit F as much as possible until we, until we reach the uh, efficient frontier. And in the CRS specification, it would be going all the way to this, uh, to this black line, solid black line, and uh, in that case, the benchmark would be for, for unit F would be unit C expanded to, to hit this uh, tip of the red arrow. So we could always expand this unit C under constant returns to scale. So that would be the, the benchmark in the case of constant returns to scale output orientation. And uh, that's in the single input, single output case. In the variable returns to scale, so what if we 
uh, require that uh, this intensity weights lambda must sum to one, so we can only use convex combination. So it's not possible to rescale uh, unit uh, C anymore. So in that case, under variable returns to scale specification, uh, the benchmark would be obtained as a convex combination of unit C and E. And uh, we, can, we can get a convex combination of C and E to form a benchmark that, uh, that will meet in this uh, tip of the ar red arrow on this broken line. And that would be the benchmark for unit F in the output orientation. And the output oriented efficiency score would then be uh, then be uh, measuring this that how what is the distance from this unit f to the to the to the broken line so by what kind of factor theta we can expand this f to get to this uh, tip of the red line red arrow so that's the output oriented variable returns to scale case so what is about input oriented so if we choose the input orientation the frontiers don't really change at all, but uh, rather the direction in which we project the units will change. So in case of the unit F, the input oriented uh, uh, efficiency uh, is illustrated by this red, uh, red uh, line going in, uh, oh, sorry, red arrow going in the uh, horizontal direction now. So notice now uh, we, when we compare to this uh, constant returns to scale frontier, uh, the benchmark is still C, but in the input-oriented case, we are now uh, scaling down this observation C until we get to this uh, tip of the red arrow. But anyway, uh, the, the uh, efficiency score is just uh, one divided by this output scaling potential. And in the variable returns to scale, now notice that we get a different benchmark. So in fact, in this case, the benchmark would be almost completely uh, unit A and, and a very small fraction of, of, uh, of unit C. So it would be a com convex combination of uh, units A and C, but uh, but uh, very large proportion of the weight would be assigned to unit A. So these diagrams illustrate the, you know, the difference of the input and output oriented efficiency measures, but also the shape of the variable returns to scale frontier and constant returns to scale frontier in the single input, single output case. So let us next get a little bit more in-depth view on this, uh, this uh, constant returns to scale and variable returns to scale frontier and what is this kind of axiomatic uh, basis of DEA in production theory. And to this end we need to get uh, a little bit more mathematical so as a very general representation of production possibilities uh, we can introduce this kind of set t and uh, so this is the set theoretic representation so the production possibility set t uh, you can think about it as this kind of uh, uh, list of all possible input output combinations that are technically feasible so we have a condition indicated here that inputs x can produce outputs y so this just means that there's all these kind of uh, combination of input output vectors x and y they must be technically feasible and and you can think about this set it could be potentially just a list of all possible well, uh, input output combinations that that are technically feasible obviously that list might be infinitely long but that's another matter so it is uh, any feasible input-output vector is, is uh, included in this set T. It's also worth to note this kind of connection between a, a production possibility set and the production function that we also, also introduced already in the first uh, lecture. So we can think about the uh, production function uh, uh, in the single output case as a, as a functional characterization of the boundary of this production possibility set. So I repeat, uh, the production function just indicates the, the boundary of the production possibility set, but uh, it turns out that this production function is actually well, be, well defined only in the case of the single output. It's very difficult to generalize the idea of uh, 
production function to the to the multiple output setting as we will see a little bit later but these these notions are obviously uh, very high, uh, closely related so please don't get scared of this kind of set theoretic notation the production possibility set is just very convenient in the sense that uh, that uh, it doesn't require any any additional assumption it's just very general representation of the technology it just basically list every possible input output combination that can be produced so in the production theory and, and especially in the dea literature there are three axioms about the production possibility set that we are we are stating by axiom i do not necessarily refer to the case that these are, these are necessarily always true but uh, they are more like uh, like uh, desirable properties and sometimes they can be also sort of normative axioms that uh, that we want to impose for the for the for the benchmark technology this kind of properties i came back to that a little bit later so first axiom states free disposability and uh, this simply means that uh, that uh, if there exists some feasible input output combination and in this case i have indicated by x prime y prime so that is a some feasible vector then free disposability indicates that we can always uh, uh, increase the use of output so we have added to the input vector some other input vector a capital a and it's also produced to decrease the outputs so we have subtracted from output y prime some some other vector b and uh, it is still feasible so in other words free disposability just indicates that it's possible to continue production if we increase the uh, input use and it's always possible to to with the same inputs produce less outputs in some context this free disposability uh, is not the meaningful assumption for example if this output vector includes some uh, undesirable outputs like pollution but we come back to that a little bit later for usual uh, usual economic input and output uh, um, it's it makes sense that uh, that uh, waste is always possible it's always possible to produce in an inefficient manner Uh, the second axiom of convexity just indicates that if we have uh, some two input output vectors that are feasible in this case there are x prime y prime and x double prime y double prime so if we make a convex combination of those uh, those feasible vectors the resulting vector is also a feasible vector And the third classical axiom is concerns about constant returns to scale. And this implies that if we have some feasible input output vector, we can always scale this uh, feasible vector up or we can scale it down by some factor D. So we can always uh, uh, decrease the, the scale of production or we can increase the scale of production and it's still feasible. And perhaps the third ac axiom is, uh, is uh, in some sense, uh, most uh, often con considered uh, um, implausible in practical applications so very often then in dea applications the third third axiom is relaxed whereas this uh, convexity and free disposability are considered more um, more valid of course also convexity is often relaxed and that can be also relaxed in fact any of these axioms can be can be relaxed and it's important to specify these uh, maintained assumptions that, so that they are meaningful for the application at hand. Um, I also want to specify that, uh, that um, even though these axioms were stated in terms of the production possibility set, of course, in the case of a single output production function, these axioms can be also stated, and that would imply that this uh, frontier production function would be first axiom would imply that production function is monotonic increasing so the frontier cannot be uh, decreasing at any point and second axiom implies that f is uh, globally concave 
and the third axiom uh, implies linear homogeneity. So, so it means that uh, that uh, that well, like in this single input, single output case, this 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 kind of proportionality holds that uh, increasing inputs by by uh, some factor d will also increase the output by by the same factor. Now let's co make a connection between these axioms and the and the DEA, DEA technologies. So on this slide, I have reformulated the, the classical constant returns to scale DEA technology slightly differently, and I formulate the DEA technology in terms of the production possibility set. So I have now express this uh, production possibility set T, but in, by using this superscript DCRS, I indicate that this is now not the true technology, but rather it is our DA estimator. Okay, so the true technology is just T, but by using this some kind of uh, uh, sample of data and using DEA, we are essentially estimating the production possibility set and our DEA estimator can be stated this way that uh, the DEA technology includes the input output vectors x and y and uh, if I interpret this uh, uh, mathematical uh, inequalities so this means that the feasible DEA input output combinations are such that they can be obtained as some kind of uh, linear combination using weights lambda okay so these input output vectors x and y included in this uh, DEA technology must satisfy the inequality that this input vector x is greater than or equal to some convex combination of, uh, of uh, uh, observed units multiplied by this coefficient uh, lambda. Output vector y must be less than or equal to convex combination of the observed uh, uh, output vectors using weights lambda and these lambdas must be greater than or equal to zero. So in this set, rep set theoretic representation, this lambda, lambda weights, we do not need to optimize. So any positive uh, or non-negative lambda weights will do. So if you think about all possible non-negative lambda weights, it characterizes this kind of set of, uh, of uh, feasible input-output vectors. Why? And we can think about this uh, set of feasible X and Y uh, characterized by this uh, technology constraints of DEA as an uh, estimator of the production possibility set. And now comes the important, very fundamentally important result for the, for the DEA, so-called minimum extrapolation theorem. So it can be formally shown that this uh, technology T superscript DEA CRS, this set is the smallest set that uh, contains all of the observed data points and satisfies axioms 1, 2 and 3, which I stated before. So this technology, it not only satisfies free disposability, convexity and constant returns to scale, but it's also the smallest set that satisfies those axioms and contains all of the observed data points. This is the theoretical foundation of the, of the DEA, in my view, that it has this kind of axiomatic interpretation. And also it ensures that the DEA estimator is unique. By giving those axioms, there is a unique uh, estimator. The production possibility set implied by those axioms and the additional condition of this minimum extrapolation then there is a unique DEA estimator. Now what about the variable returns to scale then? For the variable returns to scale, uh, we can relax the third axiom and, and only contain to con continue to maintain free disposability and convexity. So like I have indicated with these math programming formulations, in the variable returns to scale, we need to include this additional constraint that, that the sum of the lambda weights uh, is equal to one. 
So we can also do it to the set theoretic representation. So if we consider the technology obtained as the convex combinations of all uh, observed data points. So now we have this uh, uh, DEA estimator of the production possibility set indicated as, as uh, T sub superscript D V R S. So this technology then contains input output vectors that are obtained as the as the convex combination of the all other um, uh, observed data points. And also we apply this free disposability in the sense that we allow that uh, that uh, that uh, it's possible also to use more inputs and it's possible to produce less output than the than the convex con combination would indicate. And if we take this kind of production possibility set, then it can be formally showed uh, the second minimum extrapolation theorem that uh, this, uh, this uh, DAVRS production set is the smallest set that contains all the observed data points and satisfies axioms one and two. Now, what about the convexity? Can we also relax that one? And uh, the answer is, in fact, yes. So in the DEA literature, there's also a third uh, very classical uh, approach called free disposable hull or FDA. Sometimes this is considered to be a separate for model from DEA, but in my mind, uh, it's a natural special case of the, of the more classical DEA obtained by simply relaxing the convexity assumption. But I maintain this uh, terminology uh, FDH rather than invent something something else. So suppose that we take a further further case of this uh, DAVRS uh, and uh, take this intensity weights lambda such that um, these lambdas must be binary. So they must be e either equal to zero or one. So of course, notice that uh, uh, since we have uh, made the constraint that uh, that uh, sum of lambda ways must be equal to one. So in fact, it forces that, uh, that only one of these uh, uh, observed units can serve as a benchmark. So we assign all of the lambda weight to just a single unit and all others get, uh, get zeros. So if we do that, then uh, we, we obtain so-called free disposable hull FDH technology. And it can be shown that this uh, uh, FDH production possibility set is in fact the smallest set that contains the observed data points and satisfies uh, the free disposability axiom. So we have this kind of triplet of, uh, of uh, uh, constant returns to scale DEA, variable returns to scale DEA, and free disposable whole version of, of DEA, which correspond to this, uh, these uh, three classical axioms of free disposability free disposability and convexity, and uh, free disposability, convexity, and constant returns to scale. So I repeat that th then this efficiency metric is a completely separate issue that we do not need to actually solve some optimization problem to characterize this technology. So those technologies, the production possibility sets could be characterized without actually solving any kind of optimization problem. So the optimization comes from the fact that we are then using some efficiency metrics. So we are measuring some distance to the, to the frontier. And those uh, uh, constraints of those uh, linear programming problems then characterize the technology implicitly. But we can also characterize the technology explicitly like I did on the previous slides. And uh, here is this kind of connection to the to the input orientation. So in fact, this uh, classical radial input and output oriented efficiency measures go back to Michael Farrell's 1957 paper where he proposed this, uh, this kind of radial contraction of the, of the input vector or radial expansion of the, of the output vector. By radial, I, I mean, for example, in the input, input oriented case, we are trying to uh, scale down the in input vector of the evaluated unit towards the origin. And by the way, in this diagram that I took directly from Farrell's paper, this uh, 
x and y they are not actually input and output but y is actually just another input and i come back to this uh, interpretation of the of the radial input and output efficiency measure uh, in a later lecture but first in the next lesson we will we will then take a look at dea from a little bit more statistical approach to to pave a way to the to the stochastic frontier analysis that will form the next topic.